just continue this morning to declare our gratitude and to pray for our nation in song.
great to see you here this morning. Let me take just this moment to welcome you to this morning of worship. We have come here together today to worship the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for being here. And for those of you who felt comfortable coming and you came to worship this morning, thank you. We had a great time in the, uh, in the early service. And I'm just glad that you're here. And for those of you who are watching by way of television, you're on our live stream. We're so grateful that you've chosen to join us as well. And we hope that you have gathered your family together to worship the Lord right there. Let me take just a moment and say a quick word to those of you who are in this room and those who are watching by our live stream. Uh, in just a little while, we're going to celebrate the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, and if you're in this room and you did not pick up one of those all-in-one Lord's Supper cups off the tables, take just a moment. I'm giving you permission to sneak out of church just long enough to go do that. Grab one of those off the table. It's an all-in-one deal. I'll explain it to you in a little while. If you're watching us from home uh, and uh, you didn't take the opportunity we provided on Wednesday to come by and greet our staff, let us give you one of those, uh, then find something that you can use, bread, crackers, juice, something you can use to participate in the Lord's Supper with us because we want you to share this time of worship when we get to it in just a little while. But again, we're just glad that you've come to worship. If you're a guest in this room, uh, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. We want to connect with you. So if you would text the word Highland to 94,000, that would be awesome. We'd love to get a little form back to you. We'll ask you to fill that out and submit that for us. If you're watching online, you can click the link that's there in that broadcast and do the same thing. So please take a moment and do that for us sometime during this worship service or in the moments immediately after it, all right? You know, years ago I had the opportunity to go to Africa. When I came back, um, the, I, the guy, that, the customs agent that greeted me at Washington Dulles Airport, I looked at him and I said, sir, I've been through about 10 border checkpoints. I've seen all kind of customs agents and you are my favorite. He said, really, why is that? And I said, because you have an American flag on your shoulder, and it means I'm home. And so this morning, we're part, and during this Independence Day weekend, we are here to worship the giver of all good gifts. But one of those good gifts that he's given us is the privilege of living in this nation. And we have been so blessed. We have been handed a system of government. We have been handed uh, a way of life that. It's the greatest dream of a government and a way of life that's ever been dreamed by any people anywhere on the planet. We know that that dream has not become a full reality for everybody who is part of the American family, and that is to our shame. And it is something we should confess and repent of as sin before God, that that dream has not fully become reality. But we are blessed to live in this land. We are blessed to call this our home. And we take our place as the people of God who belong to a different kingdom, but we've been placed here by our king as ambassadors for his glory in this place. We have a responsibility to love this land, to speak truth to this land. And even as God instructed the Israelites to do when they were in captivity in Babylon, to work for the blessing of the place where they've been carried. And we have that responsibility here. And so we come today to celebrate our nation, but even more to worship the God who gave it to us. And we do that with great joy in our heart. I'm going to ask you to be seated just for a minute. We're going to pray. But just before I pray, I want to do one other thing. In this COVID-19 season, in this COVID-19 season, a lot of our Sundays have run together. We've not had some of the big celebrations that we get to have the opportunity to do sometimes. So in this, this, on this uh, Independence Day weekend, if you served... Uh, in our, or currently serving in our armed forces, if you've worn the uniform of our country at any point, I'm going to ask you to stand and let the people around you celebrate that and thank you for your service to our country. Would you do that? Thank you so much. We have some of our own young people who are serving even now, and we're grateful for them as well. And we just want to say thank you for the service you've rendered to this nation. But I'm going to ask you to bow with me, please, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we realize that your word teaches us that every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And so, God, we realize that every blessing in our lives, our families, our church, our homes, our jobs, 
the resources you give us, the roof over our head. God, all of that, all of those things are blessings that you have given us. We'd have none of that if it weren't for you. And Lord, this morning, one of the blessings that you have given us is the wonderful privilege of living in this nation, to let this country be our home. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we realize this morning that just like every other gift in our life, the gift should always draw our attention to the giver of the gifts. God, we don't worship the gift, we worship the giver. And so we do that this morning, and we say thank you for the blessing that you've given us to let us live in this nation. But even as we celebrate our blessings, God, we confess our brokenness as a people. God, we confess to you that as a nation, we have forgotten you. We've turned away from what we were created and designed to be. And we confess that, God. And we confess this morning that that mighty dream you gave our founders has still not become reality completely. We confess our failure in that, Lord, and we confess this morning that as a nation we have called what's right wrong and what is wrong right, and Lord, we confess that to you. And we ask you to forgive us. And God, as a church, the body of Christ, you have, you have blessed us in so many ways, allowing us to function and do what you've given us to do in this nation. And yet we've We've not taken advantage of that opportunity. We've not been the people of God you've called us to be. We've not served the way we should have served in this nation. We've not stood for the things we should have stood for. God, we confess that to you. We ask you to forgive us. God, you are our king. You've rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son you love. And we are citizens, Paul said, of a heavenly kingdom. And we thank you for that privilege. But you, in your sovereignty, have placed us as ambassadors of yours, representing you and the kingdom in this generation, in this nation. And we bear a responsibility and a weight to do that well. And so, God, where we have not done that well, would you forgive us and would you break us under the weight of that? And would you teach us how to so live as men and women of the kingdom that we radiate the divine glory of the Lord Jesus in this nation? God, I pray that that would be true of us. God, we commit these moments to you, and we thank you for the time we have just to say thank you for your blessings and the time we have to just acknowledge our own sinfulness and ask you to forgive us. And in these moments, would you receive our worship? Would you receive the honor that we tried to give you in our worship? Would you teach us through your word? And would you bring us to that place in our lives where we are who you've called us to be? And We pray that you would do that for us this morning and in us this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us once again, lifting our voices to sing of the greatness and the great faithfulness of our God. His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Sing together. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest
can be seated this morning. We're going to share one more song together before our time in the Word today. Our prayer is that this morning, what we sing and say about God would be true. And we know who He is. And this song is all about that. We're going to declare who God is and what He's done and that He is worthy. You can join us as we speak this truth together. You are here.
Amen. Well, as you're seated, let me invite you to open your copy of God's Word and uh, open it to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This morning we begin a brand new series of messages simply entitled, If. If. There are a lot of places in the Bible where great truths begin with that little word, if. And so this morning we take a look at probably one of the most well-known places where that word is used and where it speaks great truth to us. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, in just a moment we'll begin to read together in verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Again, if you did not pick up one of those Lord's Supper cups at the door on your way in, uh, please uh, take just a moment. I'll give you permission to sneak out at the beginning of the sermon. Don't stay gone long or you'll miss something. But, uh, come, but pick it up and come back because we'll need you to have that right here in just a minute, all right? Heavenly Father, in these moments we pray that as we have worshipped you with our songs, we've worshipped you by fellowshipping even though it's from a distance, We now come to your word. God, we realize that this book is exactly that. It is your word to us. And when we read it, we do it with humility and we do it with reverence because we realize that as we submit to the truths of this word, this book, we are submitting our lives to you. And that when we submit ourselves to the truths that are found in Scripture, Lord, we are worshiping you. So God, in these moments, would you speak, would you move among us, would you have your way? May we be people who give attention to your word and allow your Holy Spirit to change us, to mold us into the men and women of God you've called us to be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. After a building program that lasted for seven years, the temple of God in Jerusalem, built by Solomon, Israel's third king, was finally complete. In chapter 6 of this chapter, one chapter back from our text, it records the prayer of dedication that Solomon prayed over the temple. He praised God and thanked him for his faithfulness to the promise he had made to his people. He also prayed about those times out in the future when he knew Israel might sin against God and be be judged for their sin, when they might endure the judgment of God. He asked the Lord in in that prayer to always be merciful and quick to hear the cries for forgiveness. After he finished praying, God gave them a mighty demonstration of his presence. We read about that in the beginning of chapter 7. Then for seven days after that, the people of Israel celebrated and worshipped. They offered literally tens of thousands of sacrifices in worship to the Lord. When the celebration ended, God spoke And he answered Solomon's prayer. He spoke and answered his prayer in the quiet watches of the night. Read with me about that moment beginning in verse 12 of chapter 7. The scripture says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes, the Lord said, will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there 
perpetually. So that was God's answer in the quiet watches of the night to Solomon's prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. If you put Solomon's prayer in chapter 6 and God's answer in our text together, you find out that God might use any number of things to execute his judgment on his people when they sin. He might use drought. He might use a famine. He might use some kind of blight or pestilence. He might use a tax on their cities. He might use a crushing military defeat or even captivity. So let me just ask you, is it a far-fetched possibility to consider that God could possibly be using a COVID-19 virus or, or the violence and the rioting that we see in our nation as a, as a way of bringing about his judgment on his people? Not that God caused those things, do not misunderstand me, but that God is using those things to get our attention as a people, to execute his judgment on this nation. It is entirely possible that that is what God is doing. But in that sober warning that God gives right here, he, in his great mercy, also gives them a way back in the form of a conditional promise. Aren't you grateful this morning we serve a God of good news? Aren't you grateful this morning we serve a God of mercy? That when everything seems to be coming undone around us, that when everything we thought we understood has begun to come down, we serve a God who still delivers to us the good news that He is still in control, that He is still on the throne, that He still has a plan, that He still hears the prayer of His people when they pray to Him. I am grateful for a God who believes in and still shares with us the gospel of good news. News. Well, if you notice verse 14, though, again, it is a conditional promise. Notice what he said right here in verse 14. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now that word if is a small word with great power. If is a small hinge, but in the Bible, great doors swing back and forth on that small hinge of the word if. In verse 14, in this translation, it doesn't actually put the word if in there. It does in others. But in this translation, it is an implied if. It is a continuation of the ifs that God gives in verse 13, where he said, If I shut up the heavens, and if I command the locusts, and if I send pestilence. And then he continues the thought in verse 14, and if my people who who are called by my name will humble themselves. And so that if is a small hinge, but a great door it turns on that small hinge. In that conditional promise, God gave his people Israel, gave them a, a, a way back. He gave them four things that he would want them to do to be true of them before he healed their land. As he, as he listened to them, as, as his heart inclined itself toward them, he was looking for four things. Let's talk about those four things very quickly. First of all, he said we should humble ourselves. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You know, Solomon modeled that for us in, in, in chapter 6. This great king of Israel, this third king of the nation, and yet the first king to succeed his father on the throne. He had just led Israel through what stands to this day as the most expensive church building program in history. 
And they'd done it successfully. Now it was complete. This is a king who in that day would have been admired by his people almost to the point of adoration. And yet when that temple was finished, Solomon got in front of his whole nation and this great king knelt down on his knees before a holy God and raised his arms to heaven. And there in that position of humility, let me tell you what I believe he said. I believe in that moment he said, said, I am the king you have placed on the throne of your people Israel for this season, but I realize that you alone are God. He humbled himself before God. He said, God, you've placed me here in leadership of your people in this season, but God, I acknowledge before them and before you that you are God and you alone are worthy of the praise. Isn't that a great picture of humility? Don't you wish we had some leaders today who would do that? Who would simply say, God has put me in this position, allowed me to be in this position, in this season. And God's given me this trust in this time. And yet I realize that I'm not God and I simply need God. And and they acknowledge him as Lord. See, before we begin to see God move in our lives or our marriages or our churches or our nation, we must humble ourselves. Peter reminded the early church of how God views pride. Notice what he said in 1 Peter 5, 5. He said, God is opposed to the proud. He's opposed to the proud. He doesn't just sort of not like proud. It says he is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This statement will not come up on the screen, although I probably should have put it there, but you can write this down too. God will not use a prideful believer Or a prideful church. God will not use a prideful believer or a prideful church. Even though he's talking to the people of God here, we would go on to say in our particular case, God will not bless a prideful nation. God will not not use a prideful believer or a prideful church. Look at this statement. This will come up on the screen, and I certainly hope you write this down. We can either be full of ourselves or full of him, but not both. We can either be full of ourselves or full of him, but we cannot be both. We can't be. God will not share the throne of our heart, the throne of our lives, the throne of the church with anybody. At this strategic moment in our history, please write this down. At this strategic moment in our history, a broken nation needs a humble church. A broken nation needs a humble church because they don't need to be impressed with us. They just need to see him. They don't need to be impressed with us. We can't fix our nation. We we can't change the hearts of, of, of humanity. Only God can do that. A broken nation needs a humble church because they don't need to be impressed with us. They just need to see Jesus. So God said the first thing we have to do in this conditional promise is we have to humble ourselves. Secondly, we have to pray. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. In chapter 7, remember this. God is answering the prayers that Solomon prayed in chapter 6. So looking back at what Solomon prayed helps us understand how God wants us to pray. The prayer God prescribes for his people in verse 14 is a prayer of brokenness. It is a prayer of repentance. It was to be prayed by his people who have been confronted by their sin and convicted by his spirit. When God told his people here to pray in verse 14, he is saying pray out of a spirit of brokenness over the sin that placed you under my judgment to begin with. And if you look back at chapter 6, you learn from Solomon's prayer what two things we need to pray. First, we should confess his name. We should confess his name. You see, in one way or another, the sin of Israel that they're talking about here was their sin of idolatry. They had in some way forgotten God and turned their hearts to other gods. Can you understand that? Because we 
We are guilty of that. We're guilty in the church. We're guilty in the nation. We're guilty in our own personal lives of turning away from our God and placing our worship on some other God. We are guilty frequently of idolatry. And he said we should confess the name of God. In verse 37, he said we should confess our sins He talks about when they find themselves in captivity, when they find themselves far from God, when they find themselves under the judgment of God, that they should confess their sin to God. So what does that mean? To confess the name of the Lord simply means to agree with Him, to say the same thing about Him that He says about Himself. That's what the word confess literally means. It means to agree with, to say the same thing as. So when we confess the name of the Lord, we say the same thing about him that he has said about himself. When we confess his name, we simply acknowledge that he alone is God and that he alone can save us. That's what we do when we confess the name of the Lord. But listen to this. To confess our sin means that we agree with God about our sin. When we confess our sin to God, we are not telling him what, he, what we've done as if he needs to know, as if he needs us to inform him. We are simply saying, God, what you have convicted me of in my heart, that thing in my heart you've put your hand on and said that's wrong, that thing you've given me an uneasiness about in my spirit, that is sin and I call it what you call it, Lord. I call it sin just like you do. That's what it means to confess our sin to God. John told us if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in in this generation, we need to be people who humble ourselves before God and who pray, confessing the name of God in this generation, saying the same thing about him he said about himself and, and confessing our sin before him. He said we should humble ourselves and we should pray. But he also said we should seek his face. In all of our humility and our praying, we have to ask ourselves what we are seeking. What are we seeking when we talk about seeking the face of God? What is it we're looking for Pastor Ray Pritchard said, what you are hungry for determines what you seek. What you're hungry for determines what you seek. So let me ask you when we talk about this verse, when we, when we quote this verse, what is it we're looking for? When we talk about seeking the face of God, what are we seeking? Now, let me see if I can help you bring some clarity to this. Because for many of us, all we're looking for most of the time is the right election results. Because we think the right party or the right candidate is going to be the answer to our problems. You know how I know that? Because many of God's people never quote this verse except right around this time of year. And they never quote this verse except during an election season. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But this is our favorite verse during those seasons. So we have to ask ourselves, is all we're looking for a different uh, different election outcome? Now, Now we certainly, listen carefully, we certainly have a responsibility as citizens of this country to be involved in the political process. And to do what we think is best and right for our nation. But if we think for one minute that the answer to the soul sickness of our nation lies in either political party or in one flawed man or another, we are looking in the wrong place. For for many of us, we're looking for some guarantee of the American dream. That's what we're seeking And while I'm certainly grateful for this nation and the opportunities and freedoms it affords us, our goal as followers of Christ is not the American dream. It is the glory of God. Our dream should be His dream. We should say, God, what is your dream for our country? What is your dream for our nation? Let me dream your dream after you, God. That's what I want. See, according to the scripture, here's what God wants. God wants a pure church that in prosperity or persecution is prepared to reflect the radiance of his glory 
to a lost and dying world. That's what God wants. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not even an American. Hello. I know that comes as a shock to some of you. But the truth is what he wants is a pure church that in prosperity or persecution, whether we, whether we prosper and we see this American dream that we dream of as a reality or we are persecuted for our faith, either way, he wants a pure church that is prepared to reflect the radiance of his glory to a lost and dying world. That's his dream for us and it should be ours. The American dream is not ultimately what we're looking for. We're looking for the glory of God. God. For many of us, we're looking for an end to abortion, and we should. That's what a lot of us mean when we throw this around at election season. Now listen, let's, let's be honest. Let's clear the deck. I pray, I pray God lets me live long enough to see the awful Roe versus Wade decision overturned in this land and abortion on demand, no longer the law of the land. Before God, I pray he lets me live long enough to see that great day. And I pray he lets me live long enough to see this nation brokenhearted over the aborting, uh, abortion of millions of babies and the, that that sin has cost us. We need to ask ourselves one question. Why are we surprised as a nation when people gun down and kill innocent people on the streets when in the Roe versus Wade decision we said life is disposable? You tell me what difference it makes whether that baby's in the mother's womb or it's a young man on the street corner. But if ultimately at the end of the day when I read that I'm supposed to seek the face of God, if all I read is an end to abortion, I still don't know what I'm looking for. I'm still looking for the wrong thing. For many, particularly in this season, it is an end to racism. Now, before God, we should plead with God to forgive us of our racism, whether it is overt or subtle. We should plead with him to forgive us for letting such an unimaginable sin live so long in this country and in our churches. We should plead with God and we should work to make sure every church in America looks like that redeemed multitude in Revelation chapter 7 from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We should plead with God to help us love all men who are created in his image for whom the Savior died the way Jesus has loved us. That ought to be our heart cry but even though that should be our prayer and it should be something we work to see become reality daily it is still not what God is talking about when he tells us to seek his face so let's make sure we understand this to seek the Lord's face mean we means we hunger and we long for his presence we don't want anything more than we want him. We don't want anything but him. We're not looking for what he can do for us. We are just looking for him. We are longing for the manifest presence of a holy God in our churches and in our land. Now let me, let me say this. Listen to this statement. Write this down. Nothing will change the church or the nation more than the manifest, visible presence of God. But even if he chooses not to change anything about our circumstances, he is enough. Church, look at your pastor for a minute. I love you. I've been with you for a long time. I want you to listen to me. We are in a generation in this country and it's going to get worse where we are going to have to decide if Jesus is enough for us because we live in a generation where the landscape is shifting and there is no guarantee that our children and our grandchildren will enjoy the same right to worship and freedom that we do. That we will not see persecution in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children or our grandchildren. And at some point we're going to begin to see the Holy Spirit of God create a division in the church between those who are real and those who are just along for the ride. Because we're going to have to decide if at the end of 
the day if we don't have anything else and God doesn't do another thing to change our nation? Is he enough for us? we got to decide that. And we better decide it now before that day comes when we're forced to decide. And so we look at this and we say, God, I want to humble myself and I want to pray, oh God, and I want to seek your face, oh God. I want to long for the manifest presence of a holy God in my nation, in my church, in my family. I want to see the manifest glory of God in my life. But he gave us a final, a final thing he wants us to do. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, see, we sometimes want to skip over turning from our wicked ways. We do. When Solomon asked God to hear the prayers of his people for forgiveness in chapter 6, it was always, you go back and read it, it was always in the context of a changed heart. If their sin places them under your judgment and they're experiencing that judgment and they change their heart, they repent, they turn from that sin, they turn back toward you. They remember, Solomon said. It's always in the context of a broken and humble heart. Each time, the hand of God's judgment would get heavy. But when that happened, it broke their hearts and it changed their minds about their sin. Listen to what Solomon asked the Lord in chapter 6, verses 38 and 39. He said, if they, talking about the people of God, if they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, if they turn back to you, God, with all their heart and all their soul, Then he said, maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Notice what he said. If they return to you with all of their heart and all their soul. So when the Lord answered Solomon's prayer, he included repentance. He included a turning away from our wicked ways in this conditional promise. But here's the truth. You ready? We talk a good game of repentance. We talk a better game of repentance than we walk. I don't know if you've noticed it, but we talk about the things we need to turn away from. But we just don't ever actually turn away from those things. See, repentance is not just about a change of mind. It is about a change of mind and heart that produces a change of behavior. That is what the biblical word for repentance means. And it is not enough to just talk about it. We've actually got to do some repenting. But we also need to take note of this. When we think about repenting and turning from our sin, we confuse our wicked ways with the Lord's, I mean, with the world's wicked ways. We confuse our wicked ways with the world's wicked ways. Can I, can I just ask you something? We, we, we want the world to turn around. We're looking for, for the political party, the media, the entertainment industry, the lost world to turn from its wicked ways. And, and you know what the real tragedy of this is? The tragedy of that is that's what we, that, that, that we think that's what he meant right here. But no, he's talking to his people. So, see, so we look at the world and we are shocked that the world is living like the world. Why does it surprise us to know that the lost world is living like the lost world? They're just being who they are. But in this verse, God is talking to his people, to the people he has redeemed, to the people he has blessed. And he's saying, you need to turn from your sin. We we, we don't need to start with what needs to change in the nation. We need to start with what needs to change in me, in us, right here. Because we confuse our wicked ways with the world's wicked ways. And what should surprise us is not that the world lives like the world. It should surprise us that the church lives so much like the world. That's what should break our heart. But, but we, also, we also struggle with it at this point because we want God to go first. Have you noticed this? He made this a conditional promise. But we want God to go first. God. You bless this nation. God, you bless the church. God, you bless my family, and I will turn away from my wicked ways. And we stand back and we say, God, you go first. God, bless me. God, bless me. 
God made this a conditional promise. And he said, if my people, the people who are called by my name. In this generation, that's us, church. It's not the nation. It's the church. It's the redeemed people of God. It's us. If my people, we, we think that the nation is the people of God, that somehow we've become the new Israel, and nothing could be further from the truth. He, when we talk about the people of God in this day, we're talking about the church, the people who've been redeemed by his grace through the blood of his son on the cross for us. That's who we are, and he's called us to turn from our wicked ways. And he said, I'm waiting to bless you. I'm waiting. See, the, the beautiful part about this is we serve a faithful God. And, and the good news today is we've read the end of this promise that said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The good news is that God is a God we can trust who is faithful to his promises the only question is, will we be faithful to him? Will we be faithful to him? See, this morning we just need to be humbled in the presence of a holy God. And we need to be reminded that we belong to him. This morning, for those of us that are followers of Christ, nothing brings us to the place of brokenness more than the cross. See, the cross reminds us of our sin. It reminds us that we are rebels, that our hearts are sinful and full of shame. By our sin, we separated ourselves from a holy God. We deserve to die under the sentence of his judgment because we are the ones who sin. Only God could provide a way back to him. The cross also reminds us that of the way that he provided. When we were far away from God and in the bondage that our own sin had created for us, he came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And he became our substitute and he died in our place and rescued us from our sin. He endured the wrath of God for us in our place. And the cross reminds us of those things. And nothing reminds us of the cross more than the very symbolic act that Jesus gave to the church. We call it the Lord's Supper. In fact, Jesus told his disciples that it was not only a symbolic act of worship that reminds us of the cross... But he said, it is the way that we proclaim his death until he comes again. So this morning, because of the season that we're in, and out of a desire for the safety of everyone who is here, we, we will not be distributing those elements like we normally would, one at a time, but instead you hold in your hand a small container that includes both. Let me ask you to get that this morning, just get it in your hands and when you remove the very top wrapper, you will find the bread. And when you remove the next layer, you'll find the juice. Now, even if you are not a member of the Highland family this morning, we invite you to join with us in this celebration, this moment of worship. As long as you have made the life-changing decision to follow Christ as your Savior, you're welcome at his table with us. So I'll ask you to go ahead and remove the very top clear label, a uh, clear uh, wrapper. You have to be very careful or you'll end up taking it all off at once. But if you remove that top layer right there, you find a little wafer right there underneath. I'm going to ask you to get that and hold that, please. This small piece of bread that we eat reminds us that on the cross, he suffered at the hands of wicked men. His body was broken as he was nailed to the cross. When we eat it, we do it together. 
we do it to remember him. And then if you'll reach and take that next tab and open that little cup of juice. That small taste of juice that we drink when we celebrate the Lord's Supper reminds us of the blood he shed. It's the final sacrifice for sin. We realize that he paid in full for our sin. He suffered and bled and died bearing the wrath of God that we might not have to. And when we drink this little cup of juice together, we remember him. Nothing reminds us of who we are, his people, more than the Lord's Supper. No act of worship should cause us to humble ourselves or pray or seek His face more than this act of worship. Nothing should bring us together in unity more than this act of worship because it reminds us that we are all one in the body of Christ and the ground around the cross is level. And nothing should move us to turn from our wicked ways more than being reminded of the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow with me, please. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And in the quiet stillness of this moment, would you simply ask the Lord to examine your heart Would you ask him this morning if you have made that decision to follow Christ? You know in your heart whether you have or not. You know whether there's been a moment in your life when you've stepped over that line in a personal faith commitment to Jesus Christ. And if that moment has never happened in your life, whether you're in this room or watching us on live stream, I would invite you today to give your life to Jesus. Not to the church. Not to some kind of hybrid religion, nationalism, but but to Jesus. To the Savior who stepped in your place and died for your sin on the cross. Bearing the weight of your sin his body broken, his blood shed as he was nailed to the tree. And he bore the wrath of God for you. And right now he simply says that if you're willing to turn from your sin and you're willing to place your trust in Christ Jesus alone, he will save you. So right here, right now, would you call on the name of the Lord and would you ask him to do exactly that, ask him to save you? Tell him that you know you're a sinner and you know he died on the cross for your sin. Just tell him that you know there is no other way of salvation for you, that you can't earn your salvation. You need a Savior. And ask him to forgive you of your sin, to come into your heart and save you. Would you do that this morning? He loves you. Even though you're far from him, he loved you enough to die in your place on the cross. That's the good news of what we call the gospel, that that our God loved you enough to let his son die in your place, that 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 son, our Savior Jesus, loved you enough that he was willing to put his life on the cross for you. Will you come to him today? Will you surrender your life to him today? Child of God, where are you this morning? When you think about the things we've talked about, are you 
you humbling yourself before a holy God? Or do you still think you can live this Christian life on your own? You still think it's all about you? Are you humbling yourself before Him? Are you praying? Are you seeking the face of God, Him and Him alone, His manifest presence in your life? Would you ask Him in this moment if there's anything, any wicked way in your life you need to turn from? You might repent, seek His forgiveness. And leave here to walk a new way when you leave. Oh God in heaven, I pray this morning that you would move among us. And right now, if there's somebody who doesn't know you, let this be the moment of salvation. If there's a child of God who because of their sin has found themselves far away from you, would you let this be a moment of repentance and confession when they come home? God, please let that be true this morning. Oh God, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word, for your faithfulness to us. Make us the men and women of God that you've called us to be, that together as the body of Christ we might radiate the bright glory of a Savior who loved us enough to die in our place on the cross to a lost and a dying world. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. As a way of response this morning, we want to teach you a, a hymn simply called Behold the Lamb. This is how it goes. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the King. I wonder if you would try it with me this morning. Let's sing the second stanza together. The body of our Savior Jesus Christ torn for you. Eat and remember that heal the death that brings us life paid the price to make us one and so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his side invite you to stand and join us on these last two verses together. Make this our declaration today. Here we go. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember he drained death's cup that all Sacrifice 
this morning, our response to the Lord's Supper, to receiving it together, is that we would go with thankfulness. Let's sing this verse. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. And as we share 